All right, so everyone, thanks for joining tonight. So this webinar is on uh, how to do note investing with outside money. Um, appreciate all the people who showed up after the delay of a few days. So I tested positive for COVID a couple days ago. Um, I'm still, I'm mostly over it now. I've still got some cold symptoms. Unfortunately, it's like right on my nose. So hopefully my my talking can keep up throughout this. Um, I'll take questions at the end. You can also throw questions in the chat or the Q&A as, as we go through it. I'll, I'll try to keep up with them. Um, but the way that the Zoom webinar software works, they're not always right in front of me. But I'll, I will definitely go over everything at the end. And then I'll also send out a replay uh, of this either later tonight or, or tomorrow. So I'll go over some of the definitions. Um, people use different definitions for funding and outside money. And so I'll just share the terms that I'm going to use. These aren't necessarily the only ones. Um, some of the advantages of funding your deals with outside money, if you're the, the one actually buying the notes and doing the investing. And then also I'll talk about some of the advantages for being the funding partner. So I myself have been on both ends of this numerous, numerous times. And, and there's good reasons uh, for each party to do that. Um, I'll talk about some of the investing structures. I'll mention funds, but I'm not going to dive into that too much. Like that's a whole topic in and of itself. Um, but I'll talk about how joint ventures work, partials, and loan hypothecations, and then get into some of the best practices. There's a million ways you can do these, um, but I'll talk about some of the best things to keep in mind. And then if you're looking at funding someone else's um, deal. I'll talk about how to, to screen the person that's actually going to run the deal. It's extremely important. And then also, if you're the one taking on outside funding, you actually want to do some screening of your investors as well. And then I'll talk about my specific process, which is not the only one. It's the way that I like to do it. And then we'll do Q&A. So I think I got like 48 slides in here. This is... Um, ho hopefully this doesn't take all night long, but uh, we'll jump into it. So starting with some definitions. So throughout this, I talk about the operator and the investor. So the operator is the person who actually going to go out and find the note deal, get it closed, and then handle the deal either on a day-to-day -day basis or maybe if it's like a non-performing loan, then doing uh, the actual workout. So not only do they source the deal, they do the work, they pay the investor, hopefully. And then depending on the financing arrangement, which I'll talk about later, right? I mean, the operator is going to get paid for doing that. They're going to take some cut in some form or fashion. Otherwise, they wouldn't have any incentive to do it. Sometimes the operator has their own money in the deal. Um, sometimes they don't. And then the investor is the person who's funding the deal. So they're looking for some kind of a return without doing, I would say, most of the work. The investor is always going to do some work. So at a minimum, there's some screening up front and they should be paying attention to what's going on in their deal and sometimes um, consulting with the operator. But primarily, they're providing the funding and then they're keeping an eye on things as they go and then they're receiving distributions uh, from the operator. So there's some different mechanisms that operators and investors use to fund deals. Um, funds are obviously very popular. There are um, a million different ways that note funds can be set up, and it seems like that's growing all the time. So you can do a, a 506C uh, which would be for accredited investors. This is one where the operator can advertise the fund freely. Uh, the 506B for non-accredited, which has some restrictions. And then there's some newer crowdfunding structures. Then honestly, I haven't kept up with all the new SEC structures that they allow. Um, one of the popular ones, this was definitely popular like five years ago. I don't know that I'm seeing it as much these days would be a joint venture, right? So a joint venture, and a joint venture could be on a note deal. It could also be on another kind of real estate deal as well. But the operator is going to go out and find a note. This is typically done for non-performing notes. The operator finds a note, closes it, 
and then works out the loan. Either handles working with the borrower um, to get to some kind of a resolution to get it paying again, and then you know sell the note as a performing note after some seasoning, or taking it through foreclosure, which can which would require potentially you know the foreclosure process. Could end up with a cash for keys arrangement, and then um, selling the REO or do something with the REO when you get it back. Now, the way these should be run is because it's a joint venture, this isn't like a 506C fund, the investor's providing funding, but they should also have some level of involvement, right? Typically on key decisions, like the way that I like to run these is when you get to a key decision, such as uh, accepting some kind of loss mitigation deal with the borrower, sale price if you're selling the note, Sale price, if you're selling with the REO, it's usually a smart idea to consult with your investor. Um, these are often set up with the 50-50 profit split. So the investor puts up the money, the operator does the work, and then when the deal gets to a resolution, the, uh, the investor gets all of their principal back first, and then the remaining profits are split 50-50. But there's no ironclad law that it has to be 50-50. I've actually done these on other structures, um, depending on the details of the deal and what made sense. Um, <clears throat> partials are very popular. I'm not going to deep dive on this now. I actually just did a recent uh, webinar with R REIQ on the power of partials. And this is one where you go out as the operator, you buy a note, and then you sell a portion of the payments to some other investor. And then loan hypothecations are kind of my personal favorite. They're the one I've done primarily the last few years. This is where as, as the operator, you go out, you buy a note, and then you're taking a loan from an investor. And that investor, the, the loan that the investor is making to the operator um, is collateralized by the underlying note. So as, as the operator, as, as the note buyer, you know, some of the advantages of using outside money is number one, no matter who you are, um, at some point you are going to run out of your, your own money, right? So if you've taken the time to learn how to find out, do due diligence, filter them, run a portfolio, you've built a business. If you want to leverage those systems that you've put in place and scale up, at some point you're going to need additional funds. And that's, you know, the main reason why operators would take on um, outside money. It's so that they can leverage all these things they built and then continue to scale. Uh, one of the things that I really like about the notes business always have is that once you get your formulas down, even though every note deal is, is different, like no two are exactly the same, the processes are fairly rinse repeat, right? So once you get it down, it's it's reasonably straightforward to continue to scale. But generally, the only way you can do that is by taking on outside money. Now, from the investor perspective, right? Like, why would you fund somebody else's deal instead of just doing it on your own? And this is good for people who want to take advantage of notes. Um but let, let's face it, right? Like getting up to speed as an active note investor takes a fair bit of time and effort, right? And a lot of people have jobs, they have families, houses to take care of, you know, maybe golf habits like I do. Um, and so they want to take advantage of some of the benefits of notes, but they're not necessarily willing to put in the time. Um, and so funding someone else's deal uh, can be a good way to work that out. Now, generally, of course, since the, Operator needs an incentive. It's going to be taking some sort of a cut. Um, there's going to be a lower return than operating itself. But in general, you're not, you know, doing a lot of that work. And even with some of those, like, quote, unquote, like lower returns, whether it's through a joint venture or hypothecation, um, you're generally getting a higher return than you do on a lot of other investment options, right? Like, even if you do a hypothecated loan or a partial, even if you buy it at like 9%, um, you know, that's up there with the long-term stock market returns. That's often better than bond or certainly treasury yields and has a lot lower volatility. So these kinds of deals become very nice um, in retirement accounts. 
And I've even got an active um, joint venture in my self-directed IRA with another investor who is the operator, right? So even though I know how to do this myself, um, it, it it's kind of a good way for me sometimes to deploy uh, IRA funds. Okay, so diving in a little bit on joint ventures. So what is this exactly? If we look at the dictionary definition of what a joint venture is, it's a business entity with two or more parties. And with notes, you're generally looking at two parties uh, to stay kosher with SEC rules, generally characterized by a, some shared ownership, shared returns, shared risks, and shared governance. And so that shared governance piece, that's where it becomes important that the investors at least consulted in some of these petitions and has a say, they're not just along for the ride. So typically, you know, your operator, they're finding the deal, they're doing the work, and then the investors providing funding and consultation, um, <clears throat> you know, do the work for the operator means sourcing deals. It also means having a network of vendors, right? Getting set up with a loan servicer if they need to, uh, Take it through foreclosure means having the right team of attorneys. If it goes to REO, it means having people on the ground, someone to go out and check the locks um, and uh, winterize it if it's this time of year and you're somewhere up north. And then the main thing in a joint venture, right, these are typically done on non-performing loans, is handling those workouts, right, doing the loss mitigation, trying to come to an agreement with the borrower, um, and then deciding at which point to begin foreclosure, whether accept the cash for keys agreement, et cetera. Um, and then typically the way these are arranged, uh, they'll eventually sell the note. And then the way that I do this is there should be regular reporting to the JV partner. Um, I've heard many, many horror stories out there. If someone did a joint venture with someone and then they had a hard time getting a hold of them because the operator didn't, didn't answer the phone. Um, I have my system set up where for joint ventures, I report to partners uh, once a quarter. So every three months, I send them a report with all the quick all the uh, QuickBooks data so they can see all the financial details. And then what is basically a fairly uh, quick summary of here's what happened since the last quarter, here's what's coming up next, and then based on everything that's happened to date, here's where I see this deal heading. So involved in key decisions, right, for the investor. So that means we're consulting on different things. When to start legal, forbearance agreements, terms, uh, sale prices if we're disposing of the asset. Um, and then sometimes also the, the point of whether to exit the deal or continue to hold the note, right? So if you, let's say you get the note reperforming, the two parties need to be in alignment over how long they're going to season the note, right? Like you could choose to turn around and sell it, <clears throat> you know, maybe a couple months after getting it reperforming. Some people might want to season it for a year. Um, you could have other scenarios. I haven't had this one personally, but let's say um, it's a non-performing note. You're running into some problems with it and you decide you want to cut your losses and sell the note, right? So the two parties may agree on something like that as well. So as I said, these are typically structured as a 50-50 profit split. Um, and, and that's really for more of like a higher risk, um, non-performing note. I've done these on ones that what I would call more sub-performing, where the borrower is actually making payments. Maybe the borrower is not current. The payments aren't always 100% regular. So like it's not a performing note. There's a little bit of risk there, but it's not a full-blown performing note, or I'm sorry, non-performing note, we expect to go to foreclosure. So generally the pricing's higher, there's a little less upside. Um, in those cases, um, I've done a few where I've actually tilted the profit split uh, in favor of the investor. Uh, the other thing I like to do is when the investor funds the deal, the investors funding this, they're going to send one amount, but I in QuickBooks, I break this into two separate uh, actual fixed asset accounts in QuickBooks. So I have one for the purchase of the note itself. And then I have a second one that's a reserve for the expenses. So in my accounting system, it just makes it a little bit easier for me to track because I'll have another account 
in QuickBooks for the actual expenses, right? So I have a QuickBooks account that's a liability to the investor for the reserve they gave me for expenses. And then I've got this other account that's what I've actually spent in holding costs. So it kind of makes it easy for me to go through my books and kind of see where I stand. Um, and, and it lets me know, because I have had cases where deals have taken twists and turns that were unexpected and drug out a lot longer than expected. Um, and I ended up, you know, spending more than, than we originally planned. So that just makes it easy to track. Again, if you're just doing one of these, it's fairly easy to, to keep track of uh, when you start doing like 10 plus notes and especially 20 plus notes or you get in like like 50. Well, actually, I just closed on a bunch. I'm a little over 50 now. Um, you got to have systems in place to make this work. Otherwise, you're, you, you can't keep this stuff in your head. Don't even try to, to do that. Um, but then after that, the operator is going to work towards some kind of an exit, right? Typically trying to get the non-performing note to reperform or take it through foreclosure. <clears throat> and then when you exit the deal and get paid, investor gets their money first and then split profits. The other thing I often do, I don't think I actually put it in these slides. I should have. When we get a note reperforming on a joint venture, and let's say we're in that holding period, let's say we're going to season it for a year or so. So at this point, the loan is performing, right? Um, but we're not exiting yet. The investor is ultimately entitled to half of the interest portion of the payments that come in. I'll send them interest splits along with those quarterly reports. The other thing I will do sometimes, like let's say the investor put up a reserve for a foreclosure, right? Like let's say we anticipated this going through foreclosure an REO and they put up say $8,000 and then we got it reperforming and it's doing well, then I'll go ahead and return the portion of the, uh, of the reserve that I no longer need. So I'm not tying up the investor's money. Right. And what I'm doing by giving them that money back early is one, they have the option to do something else with it if they want, but two, I'm kind of also pumping up their, uh, annual, their, their annualized returns. So here's an example of one that I did um, the other year. This was in Michigan, um, Pontiac, I believe. Uh, so just running through some of the numbers. So this was a note I bought for $12,835. And the borrower, or the investor put up 9,165 reserve for expenses. I, when you're doing non-performing notes, you never actually know what your expenses are going to be. There's a wide range of outcomes, right? And so you take your best guess and you want to be conservative as the operator, right? You don't want to estimate this too small and be having to go back to the investor for more money later. That's not fun for anyone. Um, so I was trying to come up with a conservative amount and then I just kind of made this balance out to an even 22,000. Um, on the note, unpaid balance was a little over 30,000 and it had some title issues. That, that was part of the reason why I picked this up so cheaply. There was actually two land contracts on the property that were active. There was an old one from a borrower who had left, but had not actually signed a release. So I actually had to, part of this deal was I had to track down the other borrower and get him to sign, which I successfully did. Um, it's fairly low value property these days. I don't know that I would mess with one that had a BPO of 37. I usually like it to be, you know, over at least 50. Um, but the exit strategy was to work something out with the borrower, get them on a trial payment plan, maybe get a good faith down payment and then, you know, get them back on track. And then doing a forfeiture was the backup plan. This was a land contract in Michigan. Um, so it would technically be the forfeiture process. The forfeiture process is, for these pur purposes of this webinar, we can consider it the same thing as a foreclosure. It's often, though, um, a little bit less costly and faster, although this one was not fast. Um, this borrower was a royal pain, like a real hard case. Difficult to work with, evasive, would make agreements and break them. Um, the only re agreement he was really willing to make was if I, um, 
let him pay off the property for six thousand dollars, which I was not about to do when he owed over thirty. Um, and it was a kid with it's kind of a punk twenty-five year old kid who was actually a machinist. He had a good income as well. So this wasn't like a you know your typical hardship case, job loss, divorce, medical bills kind of thing, old age. You know, this was just somebody that didn't want to pay. Um, so started the legal process. He filed bankruptcy to delay it. He pulled a lot of levers to drag this out, <clears throat> but eventually it got the BK dismissed, um, took it through forfeiture and was able to sell off the REO. Um, I was really worried about the condition of the property when I was going to um, get it back, but it turned out it was actually in decent shape. Um, and so the actual expenses, this is one where, so I'd estimated the 9185 because this was so drug out and because of all the carrying costs and all the legal bills along with the, you know, bankruptcy is expensive when a borrower files bankruptcy. Um, I actually spent almost $13,000 on this. Although surprisingly, and I don't know that I've ever done this before, but <laughs> this sold for way more than my original BPO. So actually after the commissions and expenses, I actually netted 44,000 after the sale. Uh, so this one worked out really well. Uh, but this was a deal I originally estimated taking maybe 12 to 18 months and it took nearly three years till it was all said and done. Yeah. And the borrower did make a few payments early on. So he also kind of jerked me around, right? Where he kind of made it like he was going to work with me and then he wouldn't, he would stop and start. Then you had to start legal. Then you had bankruptcy. Then he had, you know, get the bankruptcy dismissed then start legal. Then he was fighting it and just on and on and on. Three years can go by pretty quick on these. Um, <clears throat> so this is an example of a deal summary that I'll send to investors uh, when we exit a JV. So up here, I've got the cost basis of the note. So this is what I paid for the note minus the principal. So in QuickBooks, I've also, so I've got four accounts for notes that I have JVs on, on QuickBooks. There's one for the, and I probably should have put another illustration of what that looks like in here. Um, but there's a fixed asset for the note itself. And so the beginning balance is what you paid for the note. And if the borrower makes some payments, then some principal portions come off. That's why this is less than what I paid. Then there's the fixed asset for the holding costs, right? So this is my total cost basis. Then I've got my sale proceeds. In this case, it was the sale of an REO. Like these were the net proceeds, not what I... Not the selling price of the home. I actually don't remember what that was. Um, but let's say this had been reperforming and I was selling the note. This might be the selling price of the note. So I had a 20K profit. And then the way the math works on the JV split. So the joint venture partner had put up 12 to 50. Actually, these numbers are a little different than what I had before. I'm not sure why. Sorry about that. Um, but they put up 12 to 50 for... My other numbers might have been wrong. Uh, for the purchase price, because this is the actual thing that I sent them, um, for the purchase price of the note, and then ninety-seven fifty, which was the um, reserve for expenses, right? So they get that first, then they get their split of the profits. In this case, it was a fifty-fifty split. So this ten thousand eighty eleven is half of this twenty-one sixty twenty-two, and so this was the total amount. Uh, that I sent to the JV of the 44164 proceeds. And then I gave them this little summary of their cash flows. So they put up 22,000 initially. This was back in 2018. Um, the borrower did make a few payments. Like, like initially there was a point where it looked like this might reperform. And so I had sent the borrower, I'm sorry, sent the investor an in, a, a their half of the interest of those payments that have been received actually did that in 2019 um, and then closed out the deal. Uh, what you do want to do as the operator in these, you want to make sure that you get all the expenses. Sometimes you have bills from loan servicers or other vendors that trickle in very late, like sometimes like several weeks after you've disposed of the note. So you, you don't want to pay everything back to the investor right away because then when you get hit with a bill, you don't want to have to go back to them and say, hey, can you chop this bill with me? 
Um, <clears throat> so what I did was I paid the majority out to the investor right away. And then once I was confident that all of the bills were paid and everything was covered, I paid off the rest. So their total just flat return on investment, right? Like what they got out versus what they put in was 47.8%. This X IRR, that's an Excel function. This is your annualized return. And really as an investor, this is what you should care about. Um, so even though they made almost 50% of their money because this deal drug out about almost three years, um, they made an annualized 15.4%. And that's pretty common um, for joint ventures. Uh, mileage varies all over the place. Like I've had ones that were home runs where investors had like over 50% annualized returns. The majority, you, you know, tend to fall between 10 and 20, maybe 25 sometimes. And I had a couple get sideways where we've gotten upside down on them as well. That can absolutely happen. And, and if you do enough of these, um, that will happen for sure. Okay, so that's joint ventures. Let's talk about partials a little bit and how these work. So back to our definition. So a partial is just when you're buying a note and you're selling some portion of those future payments and then you're keeping the back end. So I'll give you an example. Let's say we buy this note. This, this was a note that came across my desk a few weeks ago. <clears throat> so we have this note in Texas, has certain loan balance, 127,000 and change. And let's say I could buy this for 99,500, 1250 monthly payment and 195 payments remaining, right? So as the investor, if I wanted to, I, I could go out and just buy this note and hold it. But let's say instead of just holding the note and tying up, you know, 127,000 of my money plus, or I'm sorry, tying up 99.5 of my money plus, I'm really going to be tying up more like 100,000 because I'm going to have some due diligence expenses and some loan transfer costs, maybe some um, document recording related expenses. Um, let's say I sell a partial to refinance myself out of this. So here's what it looks like when we buy the note. So just like anything else, I buy the note, I'm now entitled to receive the remaining 195 payments. And so let's just assume we have 500 in expenses. We put $100,000 into this. And then I get 195 payments of 1250. We always need to consider expenses in all of these. Um, sometimes I see people look at deals and they don't factor in the expenses and that's, that's nuts. Um, if it's a really large deal, yeah, they might be a little bit in the noise, but for most deals and especially the smaller ones, things like servicing fees and, and recording expenses, like they're, they're a material factor. Um, so in this case, let's say I'm holding this performing note at FCI, that would cost $35 a month uh, for the servicing fee. So I would actually be netting 1215. So if you add all this up, well, you don't add it up, but if you use the um, either a financial calculator or the financial functions in Excel or Google Sheets, you'd have a 12.68% return, which is super nice, especially on a note like this where there's a lot of equity, right? Like the borrower only owes um, 127 and the house is over, over 200, right? So this would be like really nice to buy and hold in a self-directed IRA if you had enough funds to do it. All right, now let's say we're gonna sell off a partial and we're gonna refinance ourselves out. So on the left, this is the, the scenario we just went through, right? We're buying the note, but then when we sell the partial, so we sell the partial for 100,000, which is our total cost basis. And let's say the desired return of the investor is 8%. Now, why would an investor accept an 8% return? Well, you know, this loan has a lot of equity in it. It's a nice property, had a good pay history. It's pretty solid. And this investor didn't really have to do a heck of a lot of work other than maybe like kind of overlook the deal, right? They didn't have to go out and find the note, which finding the note, <clears throat> you know, for every note you actually make an offer on, right? You're looking at a lot more than the ones you make offers that get accepted. It's an even smaller percentage, right? So so the investor isn't having to do all of that work to find the note. They don't have to negotiate with the seller. They don't have to um, worry about sending 
getting the deal closed. They don't have to deal with the servicing transfer and all that kind of stuff is taken care of for them. Um, and so to get their return to equal to 8%, that would actually equal 120 payments. So what I'm doing is I'm buying 195 payments, I'm selling 120, and I've got no money in the deal at this point, which is really, really nice. Um, so let's look at the more visual representation of this, right? So no money in the deal. And basically after 120 months, money starts showing up for me, which is kind of cool. So I, you know, put a hundred thousand in, I get a hundred thousand out for the next 10 years, the payments go to the partial buyer. And then in month 120, for the next 75 months after that, me and my girlfriend, Allison here, would get those 75 payments of 1215 or a total of $91,000. Um, and I know some people are averse to these because they're like, well, wait a minute. I don't want to, uh, I don't want to wait 10 years. I want to get paid now. Well, if you're doing this in a self-directed IRA, you're probably not spending that money for a long time anyways, right? So this is a really good strategy in a retirement account or <clears throat> the other strategy you can do is an early retirement strategy. So one of the challenges, everybody wants to like quit their job and do notes full time right now. And, um, you know, having done it once and, and being like about three weeks away from doing it for the second time, um, it's hard. That That's a lot of work. But if you said, okay, I want to, quit my job in 10 years and you go out and do a bunch of these where now you're going to have these big cash flows showing up in 10 years. It's a really effective strategy that I don't think many people think about. And I'll probably have some more content on that uh, as we get deeper into 2024. So that's partial. So now we'll talk about loan hypothecations. Um, hypothecations is a big fancy word that confuses people. I really hate it. Um, I'm thinking of trying to invent my own word for it that's, that's more simple. But all it really is, is a loan collateralized by another loan. Um, <clears throat> so let's look at an example of one that I actually did, did recently. So we've got a mortgage note that we buy. Um, the loan balance is a little over 31000 I bought this for $24,430. There's a monthly payment of 306.56 and 221 payments remaining. So the way this looks when I buy that note, we factor in our expenses, we factor in our servicing fee. Um, in this case, I have this one uh, serviced at Allied and they only charge 18.50 a month. So the servicing fee is a little bit a little bit cheaper and this works out to 12.45% return after expenses for a pretty solid note. So that's great. But what if instead of holding it, I hypothecated a loan, which, which I did. So the hypothecation example, and again, in a lot of ways, this is similar to a partial, the way it ultimately works out. So on the left, we've got my buying of the note, <clears throat> my certain return. And now I'm taking, instead of selling a portion of the payments, I'm, I'm, I'm just taking a loan from an investor. So I take a loan for 24,930, which is um, the amount I have into it, pay them an 8.5% return. And then, oh, it's not actually payments purchased. I should fix that. Um, what, what I did was I balanced the amortization of the loan from the investor to the underlying loan. So that way the investor never gets upside down, right? And so I make them payments of two twenty three fifty seven for two hundred and twenty one months. Um, it's it's really important. It, sometimes if um, the term of the underlying loan is very long, like let's say it's like three hundred months, and even at two twenty, I, I could do this as well. Um, sometimes I'll just make the loan from the investor interest only because it just simplifies the accounting for everyone. You just need to set a reminder in a couple of years to check the balance to see if you need to reset the loan to an amortized schedule, right? So what I want to make sure is the value of my collateral on the left 
is always enough to cover the loan that I've taken from the investor, right? So like, let's say this was a shorter term. If this was like, I don't know, 60 months and I, and, and the borrower was paying down their loan, but I was just paying the investor interest only. Well, then at some point I'm going to owe the investor more money than what the underlying note is worth. Now I could still go and pay them back, but now their loan isn't fully collateralized, right? So that's a problem. So as the operator, that's something you have to keep a really close eye on. It's not a difficult thing to do. It's just an important thing you got to watch. Now, for me as the operator, <clears throat> my benefit is what I'm doing is I'm creating a monthly spread, right? I'm creating little bits of monthly cash flow, like, like, like a small dividend. Now, in this case, it's pretty little because it's a small monthly payment from the borrower. Um, but my cash flows, assuming that the uh, the borrower continues to pay, I'm getting the 306.56 from the borrower. I pay 18.50 to Allied, so I'm netting 288.06. Then I'm paying 223.57 to the investor, and I'm creating a little bit of cash flow of 64.49 which is pretty tiny, right? Like you're not going to retire. You're not going to quit your job um, off of this. And, and this is maybe not the greatest example because this is this is smaller than most, right? <clears throat> you know, if I was doing a loan that was twice as large, you know, now I'd have over a hundred bucks. Now what you can do once you get the system down is you can go out and do a bunch of them and then be, begin to scale. That's the benefit as, uh, as the operator. So the other terms of this, um, like I said, similar to the partial, but instead of the um, the investor taking the first chunk of payments and the operator taking the second chunk, we're splitting this up effectively as we go, right? So everybody gets cash flows right away. Um, so the investor gets his 221 payments of 223, so 49,000 total. I'm going to get 221 payments of this spread of 64.49, which is actually like 14K. So when you look at it from those terms, it's a little different, right? So a lot of people would look at this and say, well, why would I go bother to buy a note, take on an investor, do all the paperwork, blah, 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 for what is barely 50 bucks a month? Um, the thing is, if you have a bunch of these, they add up. And then if you're holding these for a long time, it builds up over time, right? So if I look at how much time it took me to do this deal, um, I don't know, let's say I've got like 20 hours in it, like that's pretty generous, it wouldn't take that much. My total hourly rate is gonna be pretty high. And yes, I understand that a lot of these payments are in the future and there's inflation, so you have to, um, you know, if you're gonna do discounted cash flows, my net present value is gonna be something less, um, but it still nets out really well and then the other thing that's really great for the operator when you do these is you're retaining unlike a joint venture or a partial you're retaining the upside of an early payoff right so the borrower owes 31 130 i'm in it for 24 930 if they pay it off early i could get a six thousand dollar windfall and i've gotten a bunch of those by the way and then if the obviously if the borrower does pay the loan off early, then you pay that investor back right away, right? Because there, there's no more collateral for the loan once the borrower pays you back. The cash the borrower paid you is now the collateral. So you just need to give that back to the investor and then see if they want you to um, go find them another one, which, which people typically do. Um, now, from the investor standpoint, why would I want to buy one of these? Um, there are a lot of good reasons for that. So one, you're getting, you know, depending on the the riskiness of the loan and the operator you're working with, you know, you're probably going to get, you know, an eight, a flat eight to ten percent return. Um, what's good of that, good about that, is it's, you know, higher than long-term stock market averages, better than other investment options. You're not getting fees on top of that. Uh, these loans tend to be pretty low. Volatility, yes, they could stop performing, in which case they get very volatile. But by and large, if these are well underwritten, um, you know, they tend to produce steady cash flow for the most part. From the investor standpoint, this is pretty passive, right? There's not a lot of effort um, 
that goes into that, you're letting someone who's more expense, more experienced, you know, find a note, close a deal, operate it on a day-to-day -day basis, deal with it if it um, stops performing. This is also a really good way, like if people, like if you're new to note investing and you want to get your feet wet, this is one of the good ways to do it. And again, um, really nice for retirement accounts, you know, especially if you're one of those people who's a little older and let's say you're getting close to retirement and you, you want to have some of your retirement funds in less risky assets, you know, you're not necessarily swinging for the fences and some multifamily deal or, uh, you know, non-performing note deal. Um, these, these can be very good. <laughs> All right. Now, best practices in general, no matter what structure we're using, um, how do we set these up? Like, that's one of the big questions. Well, number one, you're going to get an attorney that writes up these agreements, right? And, and there's a lot of reasons for that. I mean, one is obviously like any agreement you would enter into with another party. You just want to make sure you're in agreement. You want all the major terms spelled out you want um uh bad scenarios where something goes wrong covered up front so you're not figuring things out when people are potentially um upset and emotional and then the big one too right especially for the operators make sure that everything you're doing is kosher with all of the securities laws right there's ways you can set these up that violate sec rules where you could technically be selling a security and if you're doing that and it's not a fund and you're not following all the appropriate rules, um, you can get in some big trouble for that. You, de you definitely don't want to go there. <clears throat> um, Brian Gallagher is an attorney based in Maryland, uh, but he can set these up no matter where you're operating. I'm operating in, in Colorado. Um, I highly recommend him. He set up my uh, hypothecated loan agreements. He's really good at some of these like creative financing arrangements you know sometimes if you call a random uh real estate attorney if, if you're doing something like like some of the like a lot of people a lot of attorneys don't understand notes in general and they don't understand more of these specialized things um and there are other attorneys who can do this too but brian's the guy that i've used and he's always done a great job for me uh and for other note investors as well <clears throat> So some of the best practices as an operator, the biggest one I can't emphasize enough is just communication, right? So I mentioned for joint ventures, I have, you know, a regular cadence where I send quarterly reports um, for hypothecated loans. You know, generally what I'm doing is I'm just setting up monthly ACHs for the investor and I let them rip um, on a hypothecated loan. I don't really communicate with, with the investor a whole lot unless something happens, like the borrower stopped making payments and I had to start foreclosure or something like that, in which case I'm still handling it, but I'm just letting them know what's going on. Uh, there are a million horror stories out there of operators who took money from people and then wouldn't answer the phone. And that um, is ob for obvious reasons, uh, not a good thing. So, you know, communicate well with your partners, like be a decent human being it's shocking sometimes how many people don't um and then don't ever 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 make guarantees like you cannot do that um i have heard people say that they've never taken a loss on a note deal and if somebody ever says that that means they either don't know what they're talking about or they're just flat out lying um those things will happen right so in my communications with investors up front I'll put together a deal summary that says, here's what I think the returns are going to be. Here's what I expect. Here are the risks and blah, blah, blah. But, but you can never, ever guarantee the future and especially in notes, right? I mean, I mean, stuff happens. It's, it's, it's just the what the laws of the universe. Um, so, yeah. So, and, and generally um, I try to, re if the investor does reach out to me with a question um, on email, if they say, Hey Dan, how's it going or whatever, uh, I generally try to respond to them within one business day. Usually I do that. Sometimes I might be on, you know, vacation or, or whatever stuff happens, but that's generally what I try to do. Uh, don't be one of those idiots who, you know, waits until the investor emails them five times and then gets back to them like two weeks later. That's, that's horrible. Um, for setting up a hypothecation, 
the way that my agreement works is there are actually three documents to it. There's a loan agreement that defines the loan. There's a note. And then there, there's a security agreement that goes with it. Um, and then me as the operator, I retain the servicing. I hold title to the note. That way I can do the work. I've had investors in these before ask and say, well, I'll do the hypothecated loan, but I want to hold title. Um, the, the problem with that is if I don't hold title, then I can't have it serviced and if i'm not having it serviced then that means the investor is doing the work which like defeats the entire purpose of doing a hypothecation and within that case they should just go out and buy the loan and then hold the servicing and then because they'd be buying the loan directly right they get a little better a little better interest rate um generally i set these up to make payments to the investor um, on a monthly basis i have a few old ones that I did on a quarterly basis. Um, and, and I find it makes my processes more simple just to do it every quarter. Now, if the loan stops performing, um, the payments to the investor could stop technically, right? Well, I go and work out the loan, but then interest would accumulate and that interest is still owed to the investor. Um, and then at that point when I would get it like worked out, say I have to take it through foreclosure or whatever, you know, then the investor gets paid off with that accumulated interest. Um, in reality, what I do, because I have enough of these and there's enough cash flow, like I don't run close to the line or anything. I just set up automatic ACHs to the investor and just continue to pay them because it makes the whole thing more simple and then let them know what's going on. Uh, designing these. So as the operator, um, what are we trying to do? Oh, let me answer, ask one question that Jake had. So on hypothecated notes, what tax documents do you need to issue to the investors or expense you need to account for? Yeah, you need to send a 1099 to the investor. And in fact, that reminds me, I need, well, my accountant needs to get my 1099s uh, for, for this past tax year in 2023 set out to the investor. Um, but that, that's an excellent question. Um, so when you're designing these, like what are some of the best practices, uh, as the operator, well, obviously I want to maximize the spread, right? Like I want to maximize my upside. Um, and, and there's a lot of different ways to do that. Right. So it could be buying the note for a lower price. It can be, you know, finding an investor who's happier with a lower interest rate. Um, you need to design the amortization, um, best practice to keep it simple is you can just match the terms, right? Just match the hypothecated loan term to the investor term. But like I said, a lot of these were, you know, if the term is out there like 240 payments plus, I'll often just set them up as interest only. And the reason, the reason that simplifies your accounting is when I'm paying the investor, right? And it's amortized. When I enter it in QuickBooks, then I need to split that payment. So if it's amortized, a portion of that will be principal, which goes to paying down the investor loan. And then the other portion will be the interest expense. Um, so it just kind of simplifies everything if you can do interest only. But again, you want to make sure you don't get upside down. Um, and then as far as how long the borrower needs to stay in, the, or the investor needs to stay in the deal, you know, that varies. I generally ask investors to stay in the deal for two to three years. So even if, uh, let's say, there's 120 payments left on the loan, we've amortized it for 10 years, but the investor's like, I want to hold this for three years, you know, that's fine. Just when I pay them back, the actual principal amount will be lower, right, based on that amortization schedule. Um. So what do you look at when you're looking at a, a loan that will make a good candidate for an hypothecation. Um, one is a larger unpaid balance, right? So basically what I'm saying here is servicing fees are fixed, right? So FCI will charge $35 a month for performing loan with escrows, whether it's a $5,000 balance or a $5 million balance. Well, I don't know, maybe they have a limit when you go up. I haven't gone up that high. Um, so the bigger the UPB, the smaller the percentage that the service fees are going to be and the less they're going to affect your spread uh, as, as the operator. Um, a shorter term can actually create 
uh, larger spreads. And it, the reason for this, I'm not, I'm not going to dive into this too deep, but I'll, I'll try to explain it succinctly. But generally, when you buy a loan, right, you're buying it at some discount. And so, like, let's say I pay 80 cents on the dollar for a loan, right? And then I hold a loan to maturity. Well, if the loan's got 300 payments left, I'm capturing that discount over 300 payments. If the loan's only got a couple years left, now I'm capturing that discount over a compressed amount of time and it basically juices my my returns. So that's not the greatest explanation of that, but I don't want to dive into all the math and confuse people. Um, and then obviously the lower the price you can get for it, the bigger the spread you're going to be able to create. And then you also want to look for loans with equity, right? Because that's going to give you fallback options. Um, that ability to foreclose, God forbid, if you need to. Um, the last thing you want to do is buy a note that's kind of performing or maybe let's say like it's recently re-performing and there's no equity and like, yeah, it's been paying a few months, but it's kind of sketchy. And then do a hypothecation and then have the loan um, go bad. Um, that That's where you could really get yourself in a tough spot. Remember as the operator, right? Like I talked about the upside of, I got these spreads are going to accumulate over time. I got the benefit of an early payoff. It's all great. It's rainbows, it's unicorns. But if that loan goes bad, I'm on the hook, right? And so I'm also on the hook for not just my time to do the foreclosure, but also the expense, right? And so maybe like my other loan, maybe I'm putting, feeding $10,000 into this while paying an investor, right? So there's there's definitely a risk for for the operator. And that's, and that's part of why the, the investors accepting a smaller return than doing it themselves, right? The operator is also bearing some risk. All right. Now talking about screening, not so much the deal, but the operator itself, right? So if you're the investor, you're going to put money with someone else. It's really vital that we screen the operator. Um, one of the things that I've definitely learned, and, and I'm guessing like a lot of the people on here probably have a lot of experience in, in various forms of real estate notes plus whatever else <clears throat> is that when people get in tough situations, they can get really squirrely. Um, and I've seen people do bad things when they've, when they put themselves in tough spots that you would not have necessarily anticipated. So we need to look out for this. Um, in, in reality, you never quite know what's in somebody's soul, right? I don't know that you can really scrub enough. Um, but you definitely want to talk to people, get on the phone. Um, I've had some extraordinarily interesting conversations with other investors over the years. And, and investors, like, like if you're going to ask them, hey, what do you think is so-and-so? They will say things on the phone that they will never, ever, ever, you know, put in an email or, or put in writing on a forum. But if you're talking to them face-to-face -face or talking to them on the phone, um, that's where you can often get, you know, better information. Um, doing background checks is, is not a bad idea. I've actually only had a couple of note investors um, do background checks on me, but there's a number of services out there you can use whenever someone wants to do those. I always say, oh yeah, no problem. I, I always kind of chuckle because I started my career in the aerospace industry and used to have a clearance. Um, and I've had the, the big boy background checks, including um, polygraphs from sketchy people and whatnot. Um, so yeah, uh, always happy. And if someone's not willing to, you know, just cooperate and just sign off on a background check, that, that would obviously be a huge red flag. It's also not a bad idea to request references and ask to talk to someone else that, that they may have worked with at some time or another. If someone's been doing this for a little while, they'll be more than happy to do that. <clears throat> and, you know, the other rule that, that I've kind of learned over the last five or six years is where there's smoke, there tends to be like a blazing inferno, right? Like if, if there's if there's some aspect of someone, whenever I've encountered someone who seemed maybe a little sketch or something seemed a little, you know, off, 
um, th there there's tended to be a lot off. So so don't overlook things when when you're screening. All right. Now, as the operator, you also need to screen your investors, right? <clears throat> so your investors, you know, putting my product manager hat on are basically customers in a way, right? And so there are good customers and bad customers. And so what we want to do as the operator is find good customers and then really serve them really well as best we can. And I'll, I'll tell you that one, raising money is often a lot more straightforward than people think. Um, I know it sounds like a gigantic hurdle that you're going to go out and find someone who's effectively a little bit of a stranger, let's say at least, at least not family. And they're going to wire you, you know, whatever, 30,000, 50,000 plus. That seems like an enormous wheel to turn. It's not as big a wheel to turn, excuse me, as, as you would think. So what what's really important is, is not just finding money, like finding money in and of itself is relatively straightforward, but you want to make sure you find the, the right money, meaning the right partners to work with. And so that means finding someone who wants to work with you. Um, you should never, ever, ever, quote unquote, sell someone on investing with you. If you have to convince somebody to invest with you or give them some kind of hard sale or whatever, use some crazy sales technique to get them, <clears throat> that means they're not totally bought in and, 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 it could get rough. Like, like if something goes sideways on the deal, um, you want someone that's relatively easy to work with, right. And agreeable, um, isn't gonna, you know, drive you insane on, on every little detail. Um, but you do want someone that understands what they're doing is doing their homework, understands it, but isn't necessarily going to get caught up on, on details that don't really matter. Right. Usually in these deals there are certain big things that matter a lot, and there's minutia <clears throat> that doesn't. So as the operator, if somebody's getting hung up on minutia that doesn't matter, that's usually kind of a red flag. Um, you also want someone who's an experienced investor. They don't necessarily have to be experienced in notes, but you want someone who's invested in other things, um, especially in real estate, and kind of understands that not every deal goes the way you expect, right? Like, like I've had deals where the deal itself went fine, but let's say I bought the note, and then I had hiccups between the two loan servicers getting the loan servicing transferred, right? I had that once where it took me like four months just to get the flipping loan transferred. And um, you, you want investors that, you know, they're not going to be happy about that, but they're at least not going to like flip out on you right out the gate. Um, and, and you do want investors who understand that losses can happen, that there are no guarantees in here and that, you know, you want investors who are playing a long, a long game. <clears throat> um, if, if someone's going to invest with you and you had to like sell them on it by convincing them that they're going to like get rich quick or something like that, like you're, you're, you're setting yourself up for absolute disaster. You do not want to do that. Um, so now I'll talk a little bit about my specific processes that I use. I've already talked about them uh, quite a bit. Um, but what I do is, you know, generally I will find investors kind of through my, my network. I also have a special email list, uh, but often like investors will approach me. Sometimes they'll just email me. I've even had people like in YouTube comments, ask me, um, that, that, that's not the best way. Just, just email me or, or give me a call or something. Uh, but usually an investor will ask, say, Hey Dan, I like what you do. You know, do you have any deals that I can participate in? Um, and, and, and usually I don't right then, right. Cause it's not like I'm doing a thousand deals a year, but what I'll do is I'll add them to my investor email list. I call it my preferred investor email list. And then when I have a deal available, I'll send an email out to that list with an overview of the deal. And then usually the way I do this, the first person to respond gets the deal. <clears throat> um, if someone and, and then usually multiple people will respond. So what I'll do is the people who missed out, because the timing can be a little unfair, right? Like let's say somebody happened to be in front of an email when I sent it. 
and somebody else was tied up at work, I'll put them on what I call my short list. And so I'll save the list of those people who responded, but, but missed out. And then the next time I have a deal, I'll, I'll send a ping to that short list first that, that kind of keeps it fair to everybody. Um, these are some examples of deals that I've sent out like in an email, you know, I'll send out an email just with a short blurb and these are not real deals. These are like old ones. So don't like, these are not available. Um, but I'll have just kind of a quick summary of the deal. Like in these cases, they're hypothecated loans. So here's the 9% interest rate. Here's the funding amount. Here's the payment amount. Um, and then I'll have a link to a little video. I'll make a short, like, like maybe two, five minute video, um, with some slides showing more of the details and explaining, uh, everything about the deal often, like how I found it, why I like it, some of the things to consider, and then what the next steps are, uh, for funding if they're interested. Um, and then the, the other part of the process, right? So let's say I, you know, they've gone through that first funnel. They got on my email list. I sent them this email. They responded and said, you know, they're interested. <clears throat> Before I do a deal with someone, I want them to fill out a short questionnaire. It just basically has a, a profile, making sure that the investment's appropriate for them, make sure they have some experience investing. I'll give you an example. One time, uh, several years ago, I had an investor she wanted to do a non-performing note deal with me that was going to require a $35,000 investment. And um, her total net worth was like a hundred thousand. Right. And so for me, it, it would be wildly irresponsible as an operator to allow an investor to put a third of their net worth into a single uh, non-performing note that wouldn't make sense. So the investor questionnaire is to help me just, you know, give a first screen to make sure everything's appropriate. And then, and then often we'll have a phone conversation as well. <clears throat> um, and then assuming everything looks good, I'll give them all the details on the deal. I'll send them a copy. I'll send them access to the Dropbox folder with the collateral file, the pay history, notes, et cetera. And then when the investor has an opportunity to re review that and say, yeah, I'm in, um, I'll write up the, the documents, send them over, both parties sign, and then at that point, the investor uh, sends over the funding and then I onboard it into my system. So if it's joint venture, I'll put them in my tracker where they get a quarterly report. If it's a hypothecated loan, I'll set up uh, monthly auto payments. Uh, if it's a partial, I'll board this with um, FCI and they have some special servicing to make it really easy to handle sending uh all the payments directly to the correct party based on how the partial is set up. <clears throat> so, so that's what I've got for you. Um, if you're interested in getting on my uh, investor email list, you can go to fusionnotes.com slash investors. There's also typically links uh, if you're on my normal email list that go out. Um, if you want to have a phone call with me to discuss how these things work or had other specific questions after this, you can go to fusionnotes.com slash connect. That goes to my Calendly and you can set up a 15 minute call. Um, or you can email me directly at dan at fusion notes. Um, so now I'll open it up to questions. I think we got another one that comes in. Lynn asks, is there a way to use hypothecations to get a lump sum like cashing out a loan on a house? Um, I'm not, I'm not sure a hundred percent what you mean by that. Um, I, I mean, one thing that you could do is, is let's say I had a loan that I owned, um, and, and I had just been holding it and now I wanted to cash out of that loan in a lump sum. Yeah. I could hypothecate a loan, um, to get paid back from that. That that's one way. I could potentially do it. So, all right. Um, and like I said, you can always get with me afterwards if you folks have additional questions, but really thank everyone for joining and appreciate everyone's patience and the the couple day delay and also dealing with my voice as I'm still getting over COVID. Um, but thanks a lot for joining this. I will send out the replay links and I will uh, 
see all you folks next time.